Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the study. Uh, this is the last of A.T. Jones, uh, 1890 World Conference uh, bulletins. Um, uh, so from then on, and we're going to take a look before we go into the 1897 next week. We're going to do some more history about uh, about that time. Um uh, but yeah, this is the last, and he's going to say a lot of the things that he's already said. Uh, he's going to go into Second uh, Corinthians chapter three. Um, so there's going to be some things that we already covered that I covered last time. Um, and uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and uh, for the the opportunity we have to come together, to invite your spirit, uh, to speak to us, to educate us. And Lord, you know the struggles that we face in this world of sin. You know um, our human nature, you understand it. You know the, the pull and the tug that it has upon us to defend ourselves. Uh, to exert, to um, assert ourselves instead of trusting in you. And so we just ask, Lord, that the things that we study this evening will help us in our daily walk with you. And we pray uh, for our church. We pray for this movement. We pray for the people that we have contact with, that we have had influence with. And we pray for ourselves, Lord, that we can truly see um, our spiritual condition and our need of Christ in our day-to-day -day lives. We've been thankful for the studies in the morning over the past few weeks and the things that you have been showing us. And um, we know, Lord, that these things are going to be helping us as we have to make decisions in this movement as we move forward. We pray for Elder Jeff, and we pray for um, the people in Arkansas who are trying to sort through everything. We pray for those in Africa, the brother in Vietnam, and the ministry that he has there, the people there. And um, we pray here um, in Leduc for the ministry that we have to those around us, help Heidi and I, uh, to represent your character. Be with us now in this study, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening again. I know some people, some places in the world, it's morning, but very early. So um, the third angel's message, just a sort of recap. We know that Jones has been laying out righteousness by faith. Um, and it's not just the third angel's message. We know that there's the first and second angel's messages that are also righteousness by faith. But we are in the time of the third angel. And we have been since October 22, 1844. Now, it's true the first and second angels' messages have been repeated uh, to this movement, uh, to Adventism. Many people have not heeded those messages. And um, if we are going to accept the third angel, if this message is to do a work upon our hearts, uh, it's going to be empowered by the second angel. Without the understanding of the prophetic message of the first and second angels' messages, um, the third angel's message uh, is impotent. Impotent. It's powerless uh, to help us because we need the understanding of prophecy to give us faith. We can talk about taking our eyes off self and focusing upon, upon Jesus, but without an understanding of prophecy, all we can do is use our imagination. We can't know Christ. He has to bring us through experiences so that we can know him. We have to um, link up with him. We have to take upon ourselves his yoke. And we have to yoke up with Christ. And that means we, we need to heed the messages that God has given uh, to this church through the spirit of prophecy the Council of the True Witness to the Laodiceans. We need to recognize our uh, inefficiencies. And we need, in some way, uh, to be drawn away 
from this world of sin and to be transported by faith into the heavenly courts. And that's what Joan's message was meant to do. The unfortunate thing is that back in that history, uh, the church rejected not just the third angel's message, but also the foundation of the message, the first and second angel's messages. And, and Jones, Jones was fighting basically a losing battle because of the condition of the church, because of its inability uh, to have faith. Even if people can decide that they want to believe, um, that's not enough. They have to have a reason to believe. And it doesn't take away from Jones' messages that, that this message failed at that time. It actually uh, draws us back to this message uh, to its importance because of its failure to understand why it failed and why it it has failed in many of our lives, in all of our lives. We have not um, had that completed work of Christ that he wants to do. Now, of course, when we look at ourselves, we're going to see ourselves as sinners if we are truly looking at Christ. If we don't see ourselves as sinners, if we think that we're not so bad, that the message of Laodicea does not really apply to us, it just applies to those others, then we know we are in terrible condition. We are in the condition that Ellen White says is of the worst condition to be in. That is, to see yourself as, I'm just paraphrasing, okay when everything about you is wrong. And when we're in that condition, nothing can help us. Now, God can, of course, reach through that and show us. But when people think that they are correct, when they have no sense of their sinfulness, no sense of, of how far they are from God, and they have rejected light, uh, it's unlikely that further light is going to reach them. They have created a barrier. So this message of Jones, uh, this series, the 1893, the 1895 General Conference Bulletins, uh, to me in my early experience were extremely powerful. But I didn't have, just like Jones and, and many of the Adventists, a real understanding of Millerite history. And um, when I came into contact with this message, I recognized what it was that I had been missing. I'd been preaching Jones' message, which there's nothing wrong with, but I did not fully understand uh, our history and the time that we're in. And so, so my Christian experience was, was weak. I stumbled and fell away to some degree, not, not as, as much darkness as, as some people have when they've rejected light. But I just was powerless and my world fell apart and God had to rebuild it. And part of his rebuilding was bring me, bringing me to this movement. So anyway, let's get into reading uh, Joan's message. He says, we will begin the present lesson where we close the former one. Second Corinthians chapter two. To begin, to begin with, I desire to refer to the special point I made upon the statement that they could not look to the end of that which was abolished, and the idea of the end there not being the end of it, but the object, the aim of it. Now that's in Second Corinthians chapter three. But um, the Greek word "tell us" signifies the fulfillment or completion of anything, that is, its consummation, issue, result, not its cessation or termination or extremity. The strict sense "tell us" is not as the ending of a past state, but the arrival of a complete and perfect one. So, I mean, this is an important point because we see in people when they're often arguing against overcoming sin or they're arguing against the law as having any effect, that the law is, is to could not look to the end of that which was abolished. That is, there is something that is abolished and we need to understand what that was. It wasn't just the ceremonial law that was abolished or it wasn't the moral law that was abolished. Um, but here the end is the purpose. So that is, there is a purpose for the law. There is something that brings about its fulfillment or completion. 
but not its termination or end or extremity. So it's not the ending of the past state, but the arrival of a complete and perfect one. So God has a purpose in all of these things, and we need to understand what the purpose of the ceremonial law was, and also the moral law, because the moral law was written and engraven on stones, and it was glorious. But that moral law could not save us. It could only written and engraven on stones. It could not save us. It could only condemn us. So that law has to be written upon our hearts. We need a heart of flesh. It needs to be written on the fleshy tables of the heart. Still the same law, though. So the law itself is not done away with. <clears throat> anyway, let's go on and read here. Thus you see that the very idea in the text is that the object, the aim, of these types and ceremonies and ordinances that God gave was hidden from their eyes so that they could not see it. And the reason that it was hidden was because of the unbelief and hardness of their own hearts. By unbelief, the veil upon their hearts, uh, by unbelief, the veil was upon their hearts. So Moses put a veil over his face, hiding the glory of his face, and thus representing the veil that was upon their hearts, that caused them not to be able to look upon the brightness of the glory for fear. Turn to 2 Corinthians 3. I will read in the German beginning with the third verse. That ye, a letter of Christ, are through our service prepared and written, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in stony tables, but in fleshy tables of the heart. But such confidence have we through Christ to God. Not that we capable are from ourselves or of ourselves, somewhat to think as from ourselves, but that we are that we capable are is from God. That is, it is from God our capability comes, who also at us capable has made that ministry to carry the New Testament, not the letter, but the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit makes alive. But as that ministry that through the letter killed and in the stone is literally built, inscribed, imaged, the glory had. So, I mean, it's just different word order for the most part. It's German here. Anyway, so that the children of Israel could not look upon the face of Moses on the account of the glory of his face, which there ceased. How shall not much more the ministration with the spirit have glory? If that that ceased had glory, how much more does that which remaineth have glory? If that had glory which through the letter killed, how much more will that have glory which through the spirit gives life? For is that ministry that the condemnation preached had glory, much more has the ministry which the righteousness preached overflowing glory. For even the former part that was glorious is not to be estimated or counted glorious in comparison with the overflowing glory. For as that that had glory there ceased, much more will that have glory that abides. Now we want to study for a moment what that ministration of death was. The English reads, the ministration of death written and graven in stones was glorious. The German, the ministration that through the letter killed, the ministration of the letter which was death, would be literally in harmony with ours. The ministration of the letter, which was death, was glorious. Now, if we know what that ministration of death was, then we can go on with the rest of the text and read the whole story. That we may the better understand what is the ministration of death. I will read again a few lines from the testimony of Jesus. The Jewish leaders were filled with spiritual pride. Their desires for the glorification of self manifested itself, even in the service of the sanctuary. And according to this, what was their service of the sanctuary? What kind of ministration was it? It was the ministration of self, was it not? But what is self? It is the enmity, it is sin. What is the end of it? Death. Then what was the ministration of death? What was the ministration of the letter of that thing without seeing what it meant? It was only death. There was no salvation in it. We will see that more fully as we go on. Thus, in their earthliness, <coughs> separated from God in spirit, while professedly serving him, 
They were doing just the work that Satan desired them to do. In the sanctuary, in their offering the sacrifices, whom were they serving? Satan. What was the the ministration then? It could be nothing else than a ministration of death. They were doing just the work that Satan desired them to do, taking a course to impeach the character of God and cause the people to view him as a tyrant. Now, just this is a bit more of a side, because here we're looking at the Jews back then, this ministration of death. So they're they're going about doing what God has prescribed as far as offering the sacrifices without understanding what they're doing, having a a complete... um, misapprehension of the purposes of these offerings, believing that the offerings themselves were imparting some kind of merit. And when we look at our our own situation, we can say, well, I'm not like that. You know, the Jews back then, they didn't understand what it was they were doing. Um, They were doing this ministration of death. But in reading the Spirit of Prophecy, we can see that this really does apply to us as well. They were doing just the work that Satan desired them to do, taking a course to impeach the character of God and cause the people to view him as a tyrant. In their ministration, in their performance of the services, they were taking such a course and giving to the people the impression that God is a tyrant. And such ministry as that could be only a ministration of death, condemnation the ministry of condemnation, in presenting their sacrificial offerings in the temple, they were as actors in a play. This is all from the spirit of prophecy. What was the worship then? What was the ministry? So Ellen White's saying that were, they were actors in a play. And for many, and, and, and I'm not trying to point the figure, finger at other people, but for many of us, this is just an act. We feel if we go through the motions that there's some merit in it, but there's none. The rabbis, the priests, the rulers had ceased to look beyond the symbol, or that, the symbol, for the truth that was signified by their outward ceremonies. They ministered only the outward ceremony, and they did that as actors in a play. They did that in such a way that it caused the people to view God as a tyrant that all that was a ministry, condemnation of death. The gospel of Christ was prefigured in the sacrificial offerings and Levitical types. Therefore, it was glorious, don't you see? In itself, that thing was glorious, but they hid from themselves the glory by the veil that was upon their hearts. They did not see it or allow it to appear. Now, the reason, of course, they don't do that is because they don't want to see themselves as sinners. They don't want to see themselves as they truly are. And that's really clear in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That's the whole point of why they put that veil upon their hearts. They're not wanting that light to shine upon their, their nakedness, their sin. Even that ministration of death was glorious because in all that was that which they were doing, there was signified the glory of the gospel of Christ. If only... They had allowed the veil to be taken away from their eyes so that they could see it and so that there could have been manifest the ministration of the spirit and therefore of life. The question is, are we doing the same thing? Are we studying and not allowing uh, God's word to reveal to us our spiritual condition? Do we have a veil over our our hearts? The ministration of death was glorious by virtue of the truth that was hidden in it. Not glorious of the virtue of their ministering in it that way. Their missing the Christ that was signified in it caused it to be to them a ministration of death. So if they had seen in the, the law, whether the ceremony or the moral law, If they had seen in it Christ's character and allowed that to show them their sin, it would have been a ministration of life. Because it would show them that 
that in Christ that they die and that they can be resurrected. Christ's life could have been shown in their life, but instead all it could do was condemn them. But yet in itself, it was glorious in the truth that was hidden there, which they would not allow it allow to appear. The gospel of Christ was prefigured in the sacrificial offerings and Levitical types. The prophets had high, holy, and lofty conceptions, and had hoped that they would see the spirituality of the doctrines among the people of their day. But one century after another had passed by, and the prophets had died without seeing their expectations realized. The moral truth which they presented, and which was so significant to the Jewish nation, to a large degree lost its sacredness in their eyes. As they lost sight of spiritual doctrine, they multiplied ceremonies. They did not reveal spiritual worship in purity, in goodness, in love for God, and love for their fellow men. They kept not the first four or the last six commandments, yet they increased their external requirements. As Brother Gilbert said today, there were 401 requirements added to the fourth, fourth commandment alone. Now, he's talking about um, uh, Brother Gilbert, who's a Jewish uh, uh, Adventist minister. Um, F.C. Gilbert. Uh, I can't remember what his first name is. I think it's like Frederick or something like that, but I could be wrong. But F.C. Gilbert is who had done some presentations at this uh General Conference. Anyway, they knew not that one was among them who was prefigured in the temple service. They could not discern the way, the truth, and the life. They could not look to the end. They could not see the aim and object of that which was abolished. They had gone into idolatry and worshipped external forms. They continually added to the tedious system of works in which they trusted for salvation. Now, I, I was glad that Brother Gilbert could give that talk here today because I could see all the way through that that was the best possible preparation there could be for the lesson tonight. Those who were here saw from the few illustrations which he gave that there is even to this day a deep spiritual truth underneath these forms that the Jews are using at this time. The very truth and righteousness and life of Jesus Christ is beneath these forms yet. At the core of it, beneath these forms yet, at the core of it, but all this is completely lost sight of, and nothing is seen but the mere outward form, and in this they trust for salvation. The enmity that is in the natural heart causes their minds to be blinded to the end of that which has been abolished, and which, if their hearts would turn to the Lord, they would clearly see was abolished. But we whose hearts have turned to the Lord must see these things now, else we shall fall into the like system of forms and ceremonies, even in observing the things that Christ has appointed. When Brother Gilbert was telling of these things today, it seemed to me that it was a perfect preparation for this study, that, I, that we might see the reality of the truth in this third chapter of Second Corinthians in regard to the thought of the ministration of death. That ministration was glorious on account of the truths therein contained, even though they were hidden. Yet it had no glory in comparison with the glory that comes through living faith in Christ, who has broken down the wall, abolished the enmity, and set his people free with open face to behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, to be changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The enmity of the carnal mind is the foundation of the whole wall, the middle wall of partition, of ceremonialism, or as I would say, I would say legalism, that was built up and which was indeed the ceremonial law as it was in the day that Christ came. And in abolishing the enmity, he broke down, annihilated, and keeps annihilated forever that wall for all who are in him because in him alone it is done. Now a word further, there was always a true ceremonial law apart from the law of God and apart from the ceremonialism of the blind-hearted people of Israel. God appointed these very services 
which they perverted into mere forms, in order that the people through them might see Christ more fully revealed, that they might see God's personal presence day by day, and that thus they might appreciate the glorious salvation from sin, the transgression of the law of God. But not only did they pervert all these points of ceremonies, which God had given for this blessed purpose, but they perverted the whole law of God itself into the same system of ceremonialism, so that it all suggested righteousness and salvation by law, all by deeds, by works, by ceremonies. Yet as all these things which the Lord appointed when they had perverted them could not satisfy the heart, they had to heap upon the mountains of their own inventions in order, if possible, to supply the lack and so be sure of salvation. But it was all only death. Thus in this too, it was true that the commandment which was ordained to life, they, be found, they found to be unto death. Now, I think it's interesting that what they want to have, what we want to have is to be sure of salvation. Now, what, what people mean by being sure. Now, what is um, the assurance that God provides in the Bible? We have the full assurance of what? The full assurance of sight. Do we have in the Bible the full assurance of sight? Is that when we find assurance, when we see something with our own eyes? Is there assurance in that? Okay, we get the full assurance of faith, not of sight, right? So we would think, well, you know, if I saw something, uh, then I would, I could be assured of it. But why, why does God have faith as the source of assurance? Why couldn't he have it just that we could see it with our own eyes to be assured of it? Why by faith? Why not righteousness by sight? Because we're not. Okay, Dwight. We're not to trust ourselves. We are to be trusting more in God. And that's what faith is that we're trusting okay. His word. Okay, so, but why faith? Why has God done it this way? I mean, because we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But why has He created this, this idea, if we want to put it that way? of faith in order to be sure of salvation. Why can we be sure of salvation by faith, but not sure of salvation by sight? Well, I was going to say it's because our senses and our minds are so flawed. And when I read Romans 8, it says, uh, in verse 16, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So faith entails also dying to self, according to these verses. We okay. suffer with Christ for being with him. Okay, so Christ had to exercise righteousness by faith. Now, oh, if we yeah. go back to the Garden of Eden, because Jones has addressed this already, we go back to the Garden of Eden, Eve saw that the tree, the fruit of the tree, was good for food and desired to make one wise. Was she correct? Yes, she was, unfortunately, but she wanted to do it because of satisfying the flesh. Well, no, Self-exaltation, no, but... fulfilling curiosity, wanting to, be as, wanting to be like the confidant of God. Okay. Wanting to explore things you have no business exploring. Okay. Well, well, I would disagree with you. I understand what you're saying. But it was not true that the tree was good for food. 
or to be desired to make one wise, right? So she saw something uh, to be true that was not true. And that is, God is the source of all truth. So a child, um, how does he learn what is true, ideally? He trusts in his parents and the people around him who teach him what is true. He has to have faith. If, if we trusted in our own abilities to discern what is true, that is, if we use, you know, the scientific mes- method in its perverted form, you know, that seeing is believing, um, we can easily deceive ourselves. And that's what the Jews did. That's what we do. We can deceive ourselves that we are good when we're all wrong. Now, faith, then, is based upon who God is. It's focused upon God. All truth comes from God. All truth does not come from sight, but by faith. God is our Father. We trust him because we cannot see everything. We're not all-knowing. We're not um, omniscient, right? If if we were omniscient, maybe we could have righteousness by sight. Um, We could know all things, but only God knows all things. And so we have to trust our Father. When he tells us that there's something wrong with us, we have to listen. Because he knows us better than we know ourselves but people want to be sure of salvation they want to have an assurance that's not based upon faith not based upon trusting or knowing god but based upon their own ideas about self and about what righteousness is so we can all create a standard of righteousness that we can live up to that we can then see ourselves as righteous and in doing so, usually condemn others who aren't going to lift up, live up to our standard of righteousness that we have created for ourselves. Because if, if we have ourselves as the standard of righteousness, then we can never do wrong in our own eyes. But if we have Christ as our standard of righteousness, we can see that our righteousness is filthy rags. So that's why it's faith. And that's why it's the full assurance of faith, the assurance of hope. None, nowhere in the Bible is taught any assurance of salvation in and of ourselves. It's all in Christ. And so it's all by faith, by trusting in his merits. Now, we do believe that righteousness by faith produces works, but we don't focus upon the works to determine Uh, our spiritual condition. We look to Christ. And those that are seeking to perfect Christian character will never indulge the thought that they are sinless. They will see themselves in their true sense because as they come closer to Christ, they will more, more clearly discern their own defects of character. So anyway, he goes on. So I say there was all the time a true ceremonial law So that true ceremonial law would show us to be sinners. It wouldn't show us to be righteous. And they would have had all the time a true ceremonial law if they had been faithful to God. And if they had been faithful, that true ceremonial law would have caused them to see Christ so everywhere present and so perfectly allied to them and living in them that when he came, the whole nation would have received him gladly because he would have seen himself reflected in them as he is to do when he comes the second time. So there was the true ceremonial law, which God appointed for that purpose, in order that through these they might be brought to see the spirituality of the law of God, which is the character of Christ and his righteousness reflected and which is found in him alone. These things were to help them to understand Christ, that they might see him, as the fulfillment and the glory and the actual expression of the Ten Commandments themselves, and might find him to be indeed the end, the object, the aim of the whole of it, the Ten Commandments with the rest. 
But when their hearts turned away and their minds were blinded to these things, this caused them to turn everything into a form, as will always be done where the enmity is. The same evil thing runs through all. But thank the Lord, there stands the blessed word that when the heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And then they with open face will see the glory of the Lord. Isn't that then a direct commission from God to us to go to the Jewish people with blessed truth and the power of Christ, to show them that salvation in Christ is the end, object, and aim of all these things? Well, let this be preached to all people, that if by any possible means the heart may turn to the Lord, the veil may be taken away, that all with open face may see the glory of the Lord. But we can never go with that commission until the veil is taken away from our own hearts, until that ceremonialism or legalism is taken away from our lives. What would be the use of one who is steeped in ceremonialism going to those who are in it to get them saved from it? Therefore, God hath brought us to this word at this time. He has abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances contained in ceremonies, in, in order to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. Then both Jews and ourselves have access through one spirit unto the Father. I do not know that we need to look at that side of the question any further, because we can illustrate the subject on this side of the cross. It is almost perfected right in the mystery of iniquity today against which our work from this time forward is to be pitted as never before. Now note, when Christ had taken away all those forms and ceremonies, even those which he himself had appointed, when he had met them in himself, he was the end, the object, the aim of them, he left others on this side of the cross. He appointed the Lord's Supper. He appointed baptism. And the whole of the law of God still abides as it is in himself, not as it is in the letter, because the enmity that is in man's heart will turn that into the ministration of death today, as well as it ever did. And man who is trying to seek life in keeping the Ten Commandments and teaching others to expect life by keeping the Ten Commandments, that is even yet the ministration of death. It is a universal truth that Paul expressed when he was a Pharisee, a ceremonialist. The commandment which was ordained to be life, to life, I found to be unto death. On this side of the cross, Jesus appointed the Lord's Supper, baptism and other things, the Sabbath with the rest. And in him, they all have deep and divine meaning. But what was it that caused the people away back yonder not to see Christ in those things, and so to use them for the purposes of self-exaltation? and self-glorification. That enmity that is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, that desire of self to be glorified and magnified was there prophesied, an exaltation of self, a magnifying, a glorification of self, this side of the cross. So it's kind of a long, um, long sentence. Was there prophesied an exaltation of self, a magnifying the glorification of self, this side of the cross, assuredly there was. There was to come the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself. Now, of course, we can focus upon the man of sin, but we know that that exists within God's church today, within this movement, within our own hearts, where the exaltation of self can happen from even believing the truth that we can believe because I believe the truth or I understand the truth, that I'm somehow better than someone else, that the understanding of the truth is what's saving me. But we know that it's Christ that saves. He gives us an understanding of truth, not to glorify self, but that he can be glorified and that we can cooperate with him in the work of spreading the gospel to the world. So he says, assuredly, there was. There was 
to come, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself. Uh, we know that, that self, the enmity on the other side of the cross, perverted God's ordinances into ceremonialism. And what would self, the enmity, do on this side of the cross? It would do the same thing. It will always and everywhere do the same thing. So you can see there isn't really much difference between the Jew and his ceremonialism and the Christian and his ceremonialism. It's not like one is better than the other. Both are of the same root. They're meant to glorify self, not to glorify God. That enmity on this side of the cross manifested itself thus in those whose hearts were not turned to the Lord in those who were not converted. And the idea in this word, when it shall turn to the Lord, is that of conversion. It is not simply to turn around, but the idea both in the German and the Greek is to turn to the Lord in conversion. Those whose hearts are not converted and who yet profess to be Christians have the form of godliness without the power. They have the profession without the thing. On this side of the cross, there came in men who had a form of Christianity without power, a profession, a name, without having the thing. And here were the ordinances which the Lord had appointed and which are to be used in him. But these formalists, not having the salvation of Jesus Christ in themselves by living faith, not being in him, expect salvation in the forms which they observe. Now, I know he's focusing upon the forms, all these different forms of the Catholic Church and even within with Adventism, baptism. People can think there's merit in being baptized. But there's many different ways in which we can be formalists in the way that Jones is speaking of without even being formal. That is, we may not do many ceremonies, but we can still have things that exalt self, our beliefs, our attitude about others, little things we do and observe uh, in the spirit of prophecy, diet, dress, all these different things. And we can think that those things are somehow showing that we are better than others. Um, and that's really what formalism is. Therefore, with the papacy, regeneration is by baptism the re and regeneration being baptized instead of by Christ, by baptism instead of by Christ. Baptism becomes the essential of salvation. It is put in the place of Christ by the papacy. Now, I know many Adventists who actually believe this as well. That is, and we see this, of course, in evangelistic series. If you drive home tonight, leaving this evangelistic series, and you die in a car crash, you will be lost because you have not been baptized. You need to get baptized as soon as you possibly can. Now, does baptism save us? Doesn't mean that we don't get baptized, but we know that baptism itself can't save us. Somebody can get baptized, but if they're not converted, that baptism has no efficacy. It is put in the place of Christ by the papacy, and it's put in the place of Christ by many. There's many things that we put in the place of Christ, as really as ever circumcision was by the Jews. So the Jews had circumcision, Christians have baptism, and it can be just the same thing. You're baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church, you're saved. You're circumcised as a Jew, you're saved. Without being converted, without any effect upon the heart. And that is why... It is that the priest must always be so prompt to reach the bedside, even of a dying infant, in order to make the sign of the cross and sprinkle the water so that the child may be regenerated and saved, or that an Adventist minister has to force people to be baptized so that they can be saved, instead of actually doing anything to convert that person. To make regeneration salvation by baptism, whether it be in one form or another, that is the enmity. It is legalism. Indeed, on this side of the cross, it is the mystery of iniquity. Of the Lord's Supper, Jesus said, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Do this in remembrance of me. But the papacy makes it the very Christ himself. They make it 
the very Christ himself, and in taking it, expect to take him, not take it in remembrance of him. And thus, in taking it, they expect to be saved. So they believe they're eating the actual body and blood of Christ. And, and by doing that, they're, they're being saved. But is that any different from any of us in many other things that we do? Christ taught that his presence should go with his people still. Am I with you always? I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This is by the Holy Ghost and by faith the Holy Ghost is received. But the papacy, not having faith, and so not having the Holy Ghost, and therefore not having the presence of Christ to go with them, turns the Lord's Supper from a memorial of him to the Lord himself. And when the water is taken and swallowed, then the Lord is in them, um, or the wine. That is the papal system concerning these ordinances. And as for commandments, why? Not having the life of Lord of the Lord Jesus, which is in itself an expression of all the commandments, they must heap upon themselves a multitude of rules and hair-splitting distinctions of their own, of every sort and every kind, just as it was with Phariseeism before Christ. Precisely so. Here is an expression written by Farrar in his Life of Paul, page 26, concerning the system of Phariseeism when Paul was there and Christ came into the world. It is a word-for-word -word description of the papacy in every phase of it as it is. When we speak of Phariseeism, we mean obedience petrified into formalism, religion degraded into ritual, morals cankered by causistry. We mean the triumph and perpetuity of all the worst and weakest elements in religious party spirit. In the systems system of morals, it is the very citadel of uh, causes tree. Here too, genuine morals are cankered into the very elements of death and causes tree. I'm not really sure what causes tree is and if I'm even pronouncing it right. Anybody know what that is? I'll look up causes tree. Um, okay. So, cause, casuistry, casuistry, so, casuistry, okay, so I'm not really familiar with this word, I mean, I've seen it, uh, specious deceptive for over subtle reasoning, especially in the questions of morality, fallacious or dishonest application of general prin principles, sophistry, um, So it's um, so it's it's over subtle reasoning, especially in the questions of morals. So that's what it would be. So they have all of this. They built up this house or citadel of casuistry, casuistry. Here too, the genuine morals are cankered into the very elements of death by this system of. Um, making these distinction, moral distinctions that are really deceptive. That tells the story of the working of the enmity, the story of formalism and ceremonialism on both sides of the cross of Christ. Why then was not that on the other side of the cross, the papacy, as well as that on this? This is why. On the other side of the cross, Christ had not appeared in his fullness as he is and as he did appear in the world. There were ceremonies, forms given that were intended to teach the people of him. They perverted these forms. Then in the fullness of time, Christ himself came and the papacy perverts Christ himself into formalism. I will repeat, before Christ came, Phariseeism, this enmity, this self-exaltation perverted the forms by which God would teach them of Christ until he should come in his fullness. But the papacy takes after Christ uh, takes Christ after he has come in his fullness and perverts him, not just the form, but him, as well as all the forms which he has appointed. Perverts the truth that is manifested in him, in his fullness, and turns the whole of it into ceremonialism, legalism, formalism, still. But Christ, as he was manifested in the world, is the mystery of God. 
God was manifest in the flesh, and Christ was the ministration of the mystery of God in its fullness. He is the ministration of righteousness, which is overwhelmingly glorious. Now, when all this was wholly perverted by this enmity which came from Satan, and which is sin itself, enmity against God, and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, when that mystery of God is thus perverted, that is also a mystery. But what mystery alone can it be? Only the mystery of iniquity. That is why it is the mystery of iniquity, this side of the cross, and not so great, the other side. It is the same spirit working all the time, but not developed to the same degree. It is ever and always the ministration of death. Now let us spend a few minutes, we have remaining on Christianity, genuine Christianity. Galatians 5, verse 6, I will read, beginning with the first verse and come up to the sixth. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We have read what that yoke of bondage was, all this whole mass of slavery to which they had bound themselves. These forms and ceremonies were a yoke of bondage. Christ has set us free from all that in the second of Colossians, the second of Ephesians, and in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians. Uh, Christ has set us free from formalism and ceremonialism, from going by rules and resolutions and all these things, but ever to be guided, actuated, and inspired by the living principle of the life of Jesus Christ itself. The difference between a principle and a rule is that the principle has in it the very life of Christ itself, while a rule is a form that a man makes in which he will only express his idea of the principle, and which he would fashion not only upon himself, but upon everybody, and make them do just like himself. That is the difference between Christianity and ceremonialism. That is the difference between principle and rule. The one is life and freedom, the other is bondage and death. And we could say principle and policy, which would be much the same idea. Here's a passage in Gospel Workers, page 319, which I will read. It is concerning Christ. There is not a monastic order upon the earth from which he, Christ, would not have been excluded for overstepping the prescribed rules. Exactly. You cannot bind the life of God by rules, and of all things you cannot bind it by man-made rules. He wants us, therefore, to be so imbued with the life of Jesus Christ itself and the life of Christ himself that the living life of Jesus Christ and the principles of the truth of God shall shine and work in the life in order that the life of Christ shall still be manifest in human flesh. That is where God has brought us in him. And we are brought to this place in him by being, by faith, ourselves crucified with him and dead with him and buried with him and made alive with him and waked up with him and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly existence where he sits at the right hand of the God of glory. The Bible is not a book of rules. It is a book of principles. The statements in the Bible are not rules at all. They are the principles of the life of Jesus Christ, the principles of the life of God. They are Jesus Christ in that shape. The work of Christianity is to take Christ from that shape and by the overshadowing of the spirit of God, transform Jesus Christ from the shape once more into this human shape. When Christ was in the world, he was the Bible, the word of God in human shape. The word of God before he came into the world was in that Bible shape. Now he has gone back to God in heaven and he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ fully formed in you. Christ all in all of you. All there is of you shall be Christ within. Now then, when Christ is fully formed in you and me, the word of God, Jesus Christ, will once more be transformed from the Bible shape into the human shape. 
Then God will put his seal upon it and glorify it as he has glorified that human shape already, which was the transformation or the transfiguration of the word of God. That is the point to which Christ has raised us in this series of studies. Oh, shall we sit together with him in the heavenly existence to which he has raised us? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And what were those people preaching circumcision for? For salvation. Then he is a debtor to do everything that was ever spoken by God for salvation. Christ is to become of no effect unto you whatsoever. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. And that is true today, isn't it? Don't you see that these very scriptures that were aimed at ceremonialism in the day, in that day, are the living power of God against ceremonialism and the papacy and the form of godliness without the power that cursed the world in the last days, even to the day of the coming of Jesus Christ? Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, so notice the word hope there, which is even a weaker form of faith. Now, the verse, for in Jesus Christ, where? Looking at Jesus Christ from the outside going to him as to a reservoir or a fountain and taking something out and taking it off with me outside? No, in Jesus Christ, in him, in him. Neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. So whether you're circumcised, that's not any merit in being circumcised, nor is there any merit in being uncircumcised. But faith which worketh by love. Now, uh, this phrase here, faith which worketh by love, um, there's three different places where it talks about circumcision, um, you know, in the, in the same context. Circumcision is nothing, neither uncircumcision, but the keeping of the commandments of God is, right? But faith which worketh by love. And the third one is um, a new creature. Neither circumcision availeth anything in our own circumcision, but a new creature. So that means we can equate faith which worketh by love, uh, a new creature, and the keeping of the commandments of God as equal. They're the same thing. So Paul is equating them. That is Christianity. Anything less than that is ceremonialism in this day as well as in that day. Everything less than that is the mystery of iniquity. Now, so often we can fo focus upon the mystery of iniquity. We can fo focus upon the Catholic Church and all the different ceremonies that they do and the different pagan celebrations. And we can think that we, because we don't do those things, we're not, we're not like them, right? We can, we can look at upon health reform dress reform, all of these different things. And we, we can say, I'm doing these things and other people are not, so I'm better than other people. And that is the purpose of ceremonialism or legalism, so that you can be sure of your salvation by sight. But that is not Christianity. That is the mystery of iniquity. Everything else than that is the mark of the beast. And whosoever has not that living principle of the living power in his life, will worship the beast in his image, and thus all the world will worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Thank God for his unspeakable gift. What was circumcision to them? It was everything, actually. For circumcision itself was the seal of the perfection of righteousness by works. It actually stood in the place of Jesus Christ. Ah, but in Jesus Christ, that avails nothing at all. Circumcision meant works, all absorbing works for righteousness and salvation. Paul was 
Tell me anything more to do and I will do it, Pharisee. That is the kind of Pharisee he was. That is what circumcision meant. It was the one word that meant the whole system of works for salvation. But in Jesus Christ, what avails for salvation? Circumcision avails nothing. Neither works avail anything for salvation, nor any works at all, but faith which works. Faith finds the salvation of Jesus Christ uh, a living power in the life and working there the righteousness of God by the love of God. And this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Well, let Christianity prevail. Let Christianity be spread abroad. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. For the last part of our second of our study, we read a few verses in Colossians. Turn to the second chapter of Colossians. We will read beginning with the first chapter and the 25th verse of the mystery of the gospel. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God to fulfill the word of God. The margin says fully to preach the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, among the heathen, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach. Now, he's not going to focus so much upon this word hope here, but when we think about hope, hope is like faith, but it's a weak form of faith. And sometimes we just hope for hope, or we can be prisoners of hope. This is not based upon anything in of ourselves. If we hope for something, it's something that we can't possibly attain by ourselves. And Christ in you is the hope of glory, of the character of Christ. And with hope then comes faith. Because we hope in something that is faithful, someone that is faithful, which is Christ. Who preach? Where preach? You preach as you go. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in him, always in him, present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We are to bring them unto Jesus so that they shall abide in Christ, live in him, walk in him. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. For I would have ye know what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Who are they who have not seen his face in the flesh? That takes in us who are here. That is for us. What now? That their hearts might be comforted. Good. Being knit together in love. All joined together or woven together. No, that is not enough. But knit together in and in. Each stitch held on to the other. And the only one thread, Christ and his love in it all. Being knit together in love and unto all riches of the fullness, the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. What is that mystery? Christ in you. The annihilation of ceremonialism, the abolition of enmity, the breaking down of every wall that separates the hearts of men in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, why did he say this for you and me, who have not seen his face in the flesh? This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, into ceremonialism, into formalism, and legalism, into false dogmas and doctrines. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, in him, in him, ever in him. It seems to me that that expression has come into our studies enough for us to count it our motto for all this institute. We may have in him our watchword. I do not know what it would be that what it would be too much to go away with that ring in our ears and fastened upon our minds. 
in him, in him, preaching in him, praying in him, working in him, teaching in him, turning men to him, that they may be found in him so that we shall always walk in him, rooted and built up in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therewith with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Second, uh, Colossians 2.7. Beware of that. We are coming face to face with the mystery of iniquity. Bear of, beware of false philosophy, vain deceit, traditions, and the elements of the world, of the natural mind and carnal heart. Beware of it. Christ, Christ in him, in him alone, is Jesus Christ. Nothing avails but faith that works by love. And that love, the love of God, which keeps the commandments of God. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He put off the body of flesh by destroying the enmity in sinful flesh, by conquering all the tendencies of the sinful flesh and bringing the whole man in subjection to the law of God. This is the circumcision of Christ, and it is accomplished by the Spirit of God itself. The same blessed work still goes on in all who are in him. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And ye being dead, are you dead? Are you dead with him, in him? And out of deadness in sins and the circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened you together with him? Having forgiven you all trespasses, thank the Lord. The record is clean. God has cleared away the trespasses against us, um, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and imputing to us his own righteousness. What turned these ordinances against us? That enmity that turns into self-service, everything that God has given. Blotting out that which was against us, which was contrary to us, taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That no man, therefore, make a conscience for you that no man judge you or decide for you. Let the love of Jesus Christ in the heart decide and do the thing that is right. Let no man therefore make a conscience for you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Let no one turn aside your aim as we had it in the study on pages 166 and 167 of the bulletin. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. What is a voluntary humility? But following self-made rules and the perversion of God's ordinances for the cultivation of our own ways, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. What is the mind of the flesh? What is the minding of the flesh? It is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But Jesus Christ has abolished in his flesh the enmity, and in him the enmity is abolished in our flesh, and we have the victory. Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding to the head, which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered, and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Therefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, 
Why, as though in living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will, worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now, you know, of course, we know that there are commandments that God has given, but what we should eat, what we should wear. And but those are not the things that make us a Christian. And often what people do is they add to those things. All of these things that you should never eat, that you should never touch. Um, that are not according to God's word, just according to some kind of of. Uh, neglecting of the body it's a false humility and that's why if we understand the principles of health we can be healthy we can apply those principles but when we just make a bunch of rules it can just make us think that we are better than others and, and i'm not trying to focus here just on health there's so many other things but paul here is using this as an example are you risen with him has he raised us up? Are you there with him? Um, and, and just another, you know, it would be an example like um, on certain days you shouldn't eat certain foods. Or that's what things like the Catholics would do. That's why they did fish on Friday because, they, you know, they have to make these rules, all kinds of ceremonial rules. And, and we do that as Adventists as well. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, uh, the world knoweth, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now just a note there, see that word appear, um, says it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, it's the same Greek word that's translated, translated as uh, manifested and I'm just trying to see here so he shall appear when he shall appear with him in glory and um, so Christ has appeared we know that when he shall come we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is Christ needs to come to us now he needs to be appear we need a revelation of Jesus Christ and the day is near, and he is bringing it closer and closer. Thank God for his unspeakable gift. And thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Amen. Okay. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we give our hearts to you on the Sabbath. We ask that you, you can help us to understand these things. We know how far we are from you. Maybe we don't even have a true conception of how far we are. But we ask, Lord, that we can see our sin, that we can trust in Christ in spite of what we see in ourselves, that we can trust in his righteousness to change us, transform us, that we can reflect his character to all. We pray for each person struggling in this world of sin. We know, Lord, many times we get caught up in the things of this world and we ignore the eternal realities. But we just pray, Lord, that you can help us as we, on the Sabbath, seek your presence. Thank you for these words, for these studies. Continue to be with us. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.